Hey, David. How's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. What closet are you working out of? <laughs> Dr. White's. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I see that you're in, you're in Dr. Hassan's office. I've been kind of squatting this. I think I'm going to lose it soon. I think they're moving. <laughs> <laughs> it was good while it lasted. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'll just move. It's it's nice because it's close to like the lobby, so you don't have to walk all. Oh the yeah yeah yeah. For sure, for sure. So it's. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the um, Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds for today. Um, my name is David Jensen, and I am one of the psychiatry residents, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Syed Hassan. Dr. Hassan is a third-year general psychiatry resident here at ETSU in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, he completed his undergraduate education in um, finance at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, in Champaign, Illinois. And then he went on to complete his osteopathic medical education at Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences in Kansas City. And um, now he's with us here at uh, ETSU. And so without any further ado, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Hassan. Uh, thanks, Dave, uh, Dr. Jensen, for the wonderful introduction. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to this Grand Rounds today. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what led me to choose this topic for Grand Rounds. Throughout my training, uh, I found this oftentimes frail patient population uh, particularly difficult to care for, uh, specifically in the context of behavioral symptom management. So I wanted to take a deeper look into this topic and learn more. Uh, today, I wanted to share with you what I found. So I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Before we get into the presentation, um, I wanna make it a little bit more interactive as much as Zoom would allow. So um, I wanna take a few seconds to list out like five words that I want you to keep in, keep in the back of your mind for a later time. Um, these words are gonna be uh, purple, door, pen, tree, and ball. I'll say it like one more time. Purple, door, pen, tree, and ball. All right, we'll come back to these. All right, so now we can move into the objectives of the talk. Uh, we'll start by defining neurocognitive disorder. Uh, then we will move on to look at the medical workup for neurocognitive disorder. <clears throat> we'll also look at some common agitation scales used in the management of behavioral symptoms of dementia. Uh, finally, we'll look at some of the available treatment options for management of behavioral symptoms of dementia. All right. <clears throat> Let's start by defining neurocognitive disorder. Uh, the DSM-5 uh, classifies major neurocognitive disorder as a significant decline from a previous level of performance in one or more cognitive domains. Uh, these cognitive domains include complex attention, uh, executive function, learning and memory, language, uh, perceptual motor, and social cognition. Of course, these cognitive uh, deficits uh, should not occur exclusively in the context of a delirium, because um, if that was the case, then it would make an argument more for delirium rather than dementia. Uh, last, the cognitive deficits should not be better explained by another psychiatric condition like depression or schizophrenia. Uh, basically, uh, when classifying the neurocognitive disorder as either mild, moderate, or severe, um, you look at the level of impairment in, in cognitive performance and how that affects the patient's ability to perform ADLs. This D <clears throat> the DSM-5 also breaks down neurocognitive disorders by etiology. Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia comprise the majority of cases. Uh, most older uh, adult patients with chronic dementia have Alzheimer's disease, approximately 60 to 
Uh, and many of these patients also have concomitant cerebrovascular disease. Um, Alzheimer's uh, disease is the sixth most common cause of death in the United States. Um, there's also Lee body dementia and Parkinson's disease. Of course, chronic alcoholism, which we, which we see a lot, uh, as well as TBIs can cause neurocognitive de deficits. Then there's also other less common neurodegenerative disorders such as progressive supranuclear palsy or Huntington's disease, uh, among others that can also be associated with dementia. All right, so when you first see a patient with uh, complaints consistent with a neurocognitive disease process, uh, it is recommended uh, to get a serum B12 level, uh, CBC, TSH, and a UA. Screening for neurosyphilis and HIV is not recommended uh, unless there's a high clinical suspicion based on sexual history or travel to areas where exposure may be more common. Other lab tests that you might get uh, include electrolytes, blood glucose, and renal and liver function uh, tests. And neuroimaging, either a CT or MRI scan, is unequivocally indicated in patients with acute onset of cognitive impairment or rapid neurological deterioration. The more routine use uh, of neuroimaging in patients with dementia is controversial. Though um, the American Academy of Neurology recommends structural neuroimaging in the routine initial evaluation of all patients with dementia. Uh, many published guidelines on the clinical evaluation of dementia do not recommend uh, imaging studies routinely. Serial imaging is not informative unless there's an unexpected clinical change, uh, such as an abrupt mental status uh, changes without a readily identifiable cause, uh, new focal neurological findings, uh, or seizures. Oftentimes in practice, neuroimaging is ordered when patients present with an unusual or atypical finding or when imaging, uh, imaging findings may be reassuring for patients and families. A more extensive workup, uh, which may include a lumbar puncture, EEG, and serological tests um, may be needed for patients with an atypical presentation like patients younger than 60 or those with a rapidly progressive dementia. Typically, uh, most patients don't require a full neuropsychological examination uh, as part of an evaluation of dementia. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, full testing is often useful when bedside cognitive screens are unequivocal. On an outpatient basis, uh, this would be very useful as it helps to establish a baseline a level of cognitive function functioning. Of course, as a lot of dementias are progressive, observations over time are very useful and have a high diagnostic utility. Also, since neuropsychiatric symptoms are so common in dementia, uh, these patients should routinely be screened for these symptoms on follow-up uh, visits. We can ask both the patient or the caregiver uh, questions about such symptoms. Uh, you could ask the caregiver, um, does the patient have behaviors that worry you? Um, specifically, clinicians should regularly inquire about aggressions, delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, uh, or, uh, wandering, depression, apathy, and disinhibition. The presence of either delusions or hallucinations is associated with increased risk of cognitive and functional decline. Hallucinations also predict institu institutionalization and death. All right, so now we're gonna pause for a second as we will all do a delayed recall exercise together. Uh, recall is part of both the Montreal Cognitive Assessment as well as the Mini Mental Status Exam. We'll cover both of these lecture, or these exams in a few slides. So uh, do you guys remember the five words that were mentioned in the beginning of the presentation? I'll give you a few seconds, or I'll give you some time to think about it. All right, so the words that I mentioned um, in the beginning of the presentation were purple, door, pen, tree, and ball. Uh, how many of those did you remember? Uh, well, for us, it may not be hard to remember the five words. It can be very difficult for patients with neurocognitive disorder. Uh, 
So here we will cover some of the commonly used cognitive screens that I mentioned earlier. The mini mental status exam tests for five cognitive domains uh, and typically scores less than 23 indicate cognitive impairment. It's important to keep in mind that MMSE is, in, is effective for detecting moderate to severe dementia, but not mild impairments. <clears throat> it's a little shorter than the MOCA uh, and takes about six to 10 minutes to administer. There is also the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which takes tests for eight cognitive domains. The MOCA is more sensitive than the MMSE uh, and detects mild, uh, mild impairments in cognition as well. A score less than 26 is indicative of cognitive impairment, and the MOCA, MOCA typically takes about 10 minutes to perform. Here is an example of the mini mental status exam. Uh, when comparing the MMSE and MOCA, both screens as <clears throat> both screen both screens test for orientation and registration. Uh, both have a zero subtraction component. Uh, both of them also have a delayed recall component, similar to what we just completed together. The MMSE uh, requires recall of three words, uh, where the, whereas the MOCA requires recall of five. Both have a language component. Um, the both test for visual spatial constructional skills and executive function. Uh, the MMSE doesn't test for this component as extensively as the MOCA. Here is an example of MOCA. Um, I'm sure we've seen this before. Uh, compared to the MMSE, the MOCA has more tasks that assess, that assess for executive function and visual spatial skills, uh, which you can see across the top here. Um, again, this allows you to pick up some of the mild cognitive impairments that the mini mental statics to that exam would not pick up. When evaluating an agitated dementia patient, it is really important to try to figure out the root cause of the behavioral abnormality. As with physical symptoms, such as shortness of breath, uh, no single approach or medication can be expected to treat uh, the symptoms of agitation without regard to the underlying cause. In these agitated dementia patients, uh, you want to make sure to rule out delirium. And this could be due to infections like a UTI or pneumonia. Uh, it could be metabolic like electrolyte or endocrine disturbances. Uh, it could also be a result of polypharmacy. Clinicians should consider uh, anticholinergic side effects of drugs used to treat sleep disturbances, bladder incontinence, or other illnesses. Benzodiazepines and sedative hypnotics should generally be avoided. Um, the agitation could be a result of the patient being uh, simply in pain. Uh, the older adults with mild to moderate dementia can report pain reliably. Uh, this can be difficult to assess in patients with more advanced dementia. Other physical, uh, other physical reasons for agitation could include urinary retention, constipation, or simply uh, inability to see or hear properly. For, of course, uh, hearing aids can often be lost in the transition from home to the acute hospital setting. I personally have at times found myself uh, talking at the top of my voice to a patient only to be gently nudged by them towards the windowsill where their hearing aids might be. Uh, agitation can also be a result of sundowning. Uh, these are behavioral disturbances which commonly peak in the late afternoon or, or evening. Sundowning affects up to two thirds of patients with dementia and is closely related to disturbed circadian rhythms. Risk factors include poor light exposure and disturbed sleep. Of course, an ac acute ag agitation episode could just be due to premorbid psychiatric illnesses, such as depression, anxiety, or psychosis. <clears throat> the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia is a spectrum of non-cognitive disturbances. These disturbances include aggression, agitation, delusion delusions, hallucinations, anxiety, psychosis, uh, depression, sleep, appetite changes, or apathy. More than 90% of patients with dementia develop at least one of these symptoms during the course of their disease. 
these symptoms are important to manage as they lead to a decrease in the quality of life for dementia patients and increase their chances of being institutionalized. <clears throat> I think it's important to take a second and appreciate the distinction between neuropsychiatric symptoms versus physical symptoms. In a physical ailment, such as an infection, uh, which might present with symptoms of fever or cough, and you would oftentimes treat the underlying bacterial infection with an antibiotic, thus addressing the cause of the infection and the resulting symptoms. It's important for us to remember that with the management of behavioral symptoms in dementia, we're trying to treat the sy uh, symptoms of an underlying neurological disease process um, with different etiologies like Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. In essence, since we are treating mostly just the specific symptoms, uh, it's worthwhile for us to take some time and understand these behavioral symptoms that we're often asked to treat. So here we will look uh, at the types of agitation behaviors that have been characterized in the literature. Now, these behaviors are uh, collectively rolled together in the Cohen-Mansfield agitation scale. Uh, we'll go over that in a few slides. Um, the behaviors basically break down into non-aggressive and aggressive categories. Uh, within these categories, you can break out the behaviors further uh, based on if they're verbal or physical. All right, so looking, <clears throat> looking at these behaviors in a little more detail, uh, this, this is the non-aggressive agitated behavior category. Um, some, be, uh, some verbal behaviors that might be concerning here include um, unwarranted requests, repetitive questioning, constant complaining, uh, constant negativism, or just simply like constant talking. Physical non-aggressive behaviors would include aimless wandering, repetitious mannerisms, uh, disrobing, inappropriate dressing or eating, uh, intentional falling, uh, hoarding, and restlessness. Now looking at the aggressive behaviors category, uh, verbally aggressive behaviors that might be a little more concerning would include screaming, cursing, threatening verbal remarks, sexual advances, or strange noises. Physically aggressive behaviors would include hurting, hurting others or self, as well as sexual advances. Oftentimes, we will get asked to see patients due to agitation. Caregivers may also describe patients as being agitated. Agitation doesn't really describe the specific behaviors that we're trying to treat. Uh, it doesn't provide um, it doesn't really provide any sort of context and doesn't really provide us with any information about the severity of the symptoms or about, uh, or about any safety concerns that might be present. To alleviate this problem, uh, the, the APA recommends the use of quantitative uh, scales for the management uh, of behavioral symptoms. Quantitative measures provide a structured, replicable way, replicable way to document the patient's baseline function, uh, symptoms and determine which symptoms, if any, should be the target of interventions based on factors such as frequency of occurrence, magnitude, potential for associated harm to the patient or others, uh, and associated distress to the patient. Use of quantitative, quantitative measures as treatment proceeds allow more precise tracking of whether non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatments are having their intended effects or whether a shift in the treatment plan is needed. We will go over three commonly used agitation scales that are often found in the literature. Starting from the top left here, uh, the first one is the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Inventory, which assesses the patient behavior over 29 items. These, base, uh, these behaviors are basically uh, in the same categories that we have looked, up, uh, looked at in the past couple of slides. Uh, each item is scored from one to seven based on the frequency of the behavior over the last two weeks. Um, the scale takes about 20 minutes to administer. Next, moving, moving to the bottom left here. Um, there's also the brief uh, agitation rating scale, uh, which essentially is a shorter version of the CMAI uh, and consists of 10 minutes, uh, 10 items, and takes about five minutes to administer. Uh, 
Now, it's important to remember that both of these scales look at just the frequency of the behavior. Only on the uh, top right here, there is also the neuropsychiatric inventory, uh, which is a 12 item scale that looks at behavior over the last one month. Each of the 12 items assessed are rated for severity, frequency, and the distress that they impose for the caregiver. We also have a shorter version of this scale <clears throat> called the NPH for nursing homes, uh, which takes about five minutes to administer. Here is an uh, example of the CMAI. Uh, it's a relatively busy slide, uh, so I'll give you some time to look at it. Again, it's essentially um, a list of behaviors that can be broken down into verbal or physical agitation symptoms um, that are either aggressive or non-aggressive. For example, um, I might be taking care of a patient on the floor who might be trying to throw things. This behavior could then be marked according to frequency of the event, which could range from less than once a week uh, to several times in an hour. The same thing could be done for either be, uh, for other behaviors, uh, <clears throat> such as screaming or cursing, and so on and so forth. Non-pharmacological options are first line for behavioral symptoms of dementia. For starters, you, for starters, you wanna make sure that the environment that these patients in, are in is safe with handrails, um, non-skid floors, uh, and that visual, uh, visual directions to different rooms are clearly written. Uh, you also wanna make sure that the common objects that the patient might need are prominently placed. When speaking with the patient, you wanna make sure that you speak softly um, and in a tone that the patient can understand and provide clear, repetitive instructions. If agitated, uh, you wanna try as much as possible to distract uh, or redirect the patient if, appro if appropriate. <clears throat> also, you wanna make sure that the patient's day has a set routine. Uh, behavioral interventions include uh, ident identifying events leading up to the agitation, uh, ident identifying any unmet needs, and avoiding any sudden changes in the environment. This, of course, would include both the physical environment and the staff. You also wanna make sure to address any sleep break disturbances, including insomnia, uh, by ensuring a set sleeping time for the patient. Other options include aromatherapy. Uh, you wanna make sure these patients are getting uh, exercise. Um, music therapy is another great option. Uh, pet therapy, massage, and touch therapy are all options for these patients. So now uh, we move on to the pharmacological ph <clears throat> move on to the pharmacological options for agitated dementia patients. It's important to remember that a lot of the medications here are used off label, uh, as they don't have an FDA approval for for the specific indication of behavioral symptoms of dementia. Uh, interestingly, Risperdal is licensed for the uh, treatment of severe behavioral symptoms of dementia uh, in Australia. Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, but not in the United States. The other medication to note would be Neuplazid, uh, which was approved by the FDA in 2016 for hallucinations and delusions associated with Parkinson's disease psychosis. <clears throat> However, even Neuplazid is not approved for treatment of dementia-related psychosis, which isn't specifically related, related with Parkinson's disease. There's no clear medication option that is superior uh, and treatment usually requires both a behavioral intervention and pharmacotherapy. Let's start by talking about acetylcholine esterase inhibitors and nemantine. Here we are discussing these medications in the context of agitation in dementia. It's generally suggested to start a cholinesterase inhibitor uh, for mild to moderate dementia patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms. Even though the small benefits seen in the literature with the use of these medications in this context may be of questionable clinical significance, 
they are usually well tolerated and may have an additional benefit for cognition and function. Evidence for the use of memantine in this context is limited and mixed. Of course, it's important to remember that these medications <coughs> may slow the progression of the neurocognitive disease, but don't actually reverse the, neuro <coughs> the, the, neuro the degenerative process that has already occurred. Another thing to keep in mind uh, is that patients with dementia with Lewy body uh, may have a more beneficial response to these medications than those with Alzheimer's disease. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, work by increasing the level of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Denepazil is the most prescribed of the three medications. Uh, it's indicated for the entire spectrum of severity in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it has a half-life of about 70 hours. Uh, starting dose is typically five milligrams per day. Uh, as a class, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors generally have a similar side effect profile, <clears throat> which includes uh, diarrhea, nausea, uh, vomiting. Uh, you want to use them with caution in underweight patients due to, to the risk of weight loss. You also have a rare risk of bradycardia, uh, so you want to be careful if you're using them with a beta blocker. Galantamine is another acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It's indicated for both mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease, so it doesn't have an indication for severe dementia, which the denepazil on the prior slide did. It has a half-life of seven hours, which requires for it to be dosed twice day, uh, daily. Uh, this can potentially pose a challenge for compliance in this patient population. Usually, the, the starting dose is about four milligrams twice a day. <clears throat> the next acetylcholinesterase inhibitor uh, is rivastigmine. The oral formulation is indicated for mild and moderate dementia. Uh, this medication also comes as a patch, which also has the additional indication for being approved for severe dementia. So essentially, uh, if you're looking at severe dementia, uh, your treatment choices in terms of cholinesterase inhibitors are limited to denepazil and the rivastigmine patch. Rivastigmine is the only acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that also has an indication for Parkinson's disease. Rivastigmine works by inhibiting both acetylcholinesterase as well as butylcholinesterase. Butylcholinesterase is, found, is mostly found in the liver and GI tract, uh, and this may explain why rivastigmine causes more GI side effects than the other cholinesterase inhibitors. It has a half-life of about 1.5 hours, uh, requiring twice daily oral dosing. Next, we will talk about memantine. Uh, memantine has a different mechanism, uh, mechanism of action in that it is a <clears throat> NMDA receptor antagonist. It's indicated for moderate and severe Alzheimer's disease. The half-life of this medication is about 60 to 80 hours. Um, the most common side effects of this medication include dizziness, transient confusion, uh, headaches, diarrhea, constipation, and sedation. Now uh, we will move on to antidepressants uh, as they may be applicable for the behavioral symptoms of dementia. As a class, uh, evidence for efficacy of SSRIs in the treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia is limited other than for depression. These medications can be useful for depression in dementia uh, or when agitation may be a result of underlying depression. The, uh, there was a systemic review conducted in 2011 that found sertraline and citalopram uh, were associated with a reduction in symptoms of agitation when compared to placebo in two of the nine studies that were included in the review. As a general rule of thumb, um, antidepressants to avoid in this patient population would include paroxetine and TCAs due to anticholinergic side effects. <clears throat> There's also a risk of cardiac toxicity with the TCAs. You also want to be careful with the use of fluoxetine and fluvoxamine 
uh, due to the risk of uh, drug drug interactions. Let's take a deeper look at the use of citalopram in the context of agitation. <clears throat> the citalopram for agitation in Alzheimer's disease trial, which was conducted three years later in 2014, uh, demonstrated significant improvement in key measures uh, of agitation with the target citalopram dose of 30 milligrams per day. These patients were started on 10 milligrams of citalopram and reached a 30 milligram dose over a three week period. They found that at this dose, 40% uh, of patients on citalopram had a reduction in agitation uh, compared to only 26% in the placebo group. They also noted improvements in the NPI inventory, uh, which looks at agitation as well as affective symptoms. There was a significant improvement noted, noted in the caregiver distress scores as well. It's important to note that the higher dose of 30 milligrams was associated with cognitive worsening and QTC prolongation in this study. Ten to twenty milligrams of citalopram daily is useful in the management of agitation and paranoia in patients with Alzheimer's disease, <clears throat> as the symptoms are often driven by a mood disorder that is poorly verbalized. FDA recommends a max dose of citalopram of twenty milligrams per day uh, for patients older than sixty years old, due to the risk of QTC prolongation and arrhythmias. Citalopram should generally be a generally be avoided in patients at risk of arrhythmias and persistent QTC greater than 500. Actually, the FDA recommends discontinuing the medication above a QTC of 500. <coughs> risk factors for prolonged QT, QTC uh, include patients with uh, congenital long QT syndrome, uh, electrolyte abnormalities such as low potassium, uh, calcium, or magnesium, uh, or heart conditions that increase a patient's risk for bradycardia, left ventricular dysfunction, uh, heart failure, mitral valve prolapse, and myocardial infarction. Now let's take a deeper look at Zoloft as well. There was another study published in 2003 <clears throat> which showed some efficacy in this patient population. They used an average dose of Zoloft of 95 milligrams per day here they found uh, Zoloft to be superior to placebo for the treatment of major depression in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the reduction in depression was accompanied by uh, lessened behavioral disturbances and improvement in ability to perform activities of daily living, uh, but not improved cognition. Of course, the APA recommends undertaking one or more trials of an antidepressant uh, to treat clinically significant and persistent uh, depression in patients with dementia because of the increased rates of, <clears throat> rates of disability, impaired quality of life, uh, and greater mortality associated with depression. There was a 2011 systemic review uh, that concluded there is limited evidence to support the use of prednisone specifically in agitation. Given that the medication is well tolerated and relatively state, uh, safe, they stated that it may help improve behavioral symptoms of dementia in some individuals. The review cited the need for further studies to determine the safety and efficacy of prednisone for the treatment of agitation and psychosis. We oftentimes use this medication in this patient population for sleep uh, with a starting dose of 25 milligrams at night um, and requiring at times doses up to like 100 to 150 milligrams. The utility of Depicode and carbamazepine uh, in the context of behavioral symptom management uh, of dementia continues to be uncertain. Uh, neither of these medications is recommended by the APA for use in agitated dementia patients. Carbamazepine carries with it the risk of drug-drug interactions between carbamazepine and other drugs commonly prescribed to the elderly. It also carries with it the risk of serious hematological abnormalities, 
<clears throat> in terms of efficacy of carbamazepine, uh, the authors of a 2005 systemic review concluded that there wasn't enough evidence of benefit for the treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, in patients with dementia. Now let's take a deeper look at uh, Depakote. <clears throat> there was a, a fairly recent systemic review in 2018, which looked at the use of Depakote um, for behavioral symptoms in dementia patients. The review included five studies with 430 participants. Um, the studies varied in uh, preparation of Depakote used. Uh, the average doses, which ranged anywhere from 480 milligrams per day to 1,000 milligrams per day. Uh, the duration of the treatment varied from three to six weeks and the different outcomes measured. The outcomes they used were the brief psychiatric rating scale and the Cohen-Mansfield agitation index. <clears throat> the review concluded that evidence did not support the use of Depco prep preparations to manage agitation in people with dementia uh, and demonstrated increased frequency of several types of adverse effects, including serious adverse effects. Common side effects mentioned in a few of the studies included sedation, nausea, vomiting, and UTI. <clears throat> the review concluded that further investigation may not be justified, uh, particularly considering the increased risk of adverse effect in this often frail group of people. Of course, Depakote is often used in this patient population, and it may be a viable option in patients who are unresponsive unresponsive to antipsychotics or who have a significant uh, or who have significant vascular risk factors making them a poor candidate for antipsychotics. Availability in liquid and sprinkle formulation allow for ease of administration. Um, the common side effects noted um, are somnolence, nausea, fatigue, dizziness, hair loss, tremor, and thrombocytopenia that is dose related. Some of the serious but rare side effects include hepatotoxicity and pancreatitis. Uh, recommended monitoring includes getting a depth coat level, a liver function test, CBC to check for platelets, pregnancy test, and an uh, pneumonia level if confusion is present. It's generally not recommended to use benzodiazepine in this patient population. Benzos have a poor efficacy for treatment of behavioral symptoms uh, and, come, and come at the cost of side effects that include uh, worsening gait, uh, paradoxical agitation, respiratory depression. Uh, so, you wanna be, so you wanna try to avoid them in patients with like sleep apnea or other, other respiratory depressants on board like opiate medications uh, and the possibility of physical dependence. They should be, their use should be limited for brief st uh, stressful episodes, such as change in residence uh, or an anxiety provoking medical procedure. If using these medications, uh, we should try to use a shorter high blood benzo. You also want to avoid anticholinergic medications like Benadryl uh, as they increase the anticholinergic burden and come with side effects like confusion, constipation, uh, dry mouth, urinary retention that can be uh, uncomfortable for the patient. Now we will move on to antipsychotics. When non-pharmacological interventions and other pharmacological approaches fail to manage neuropsychiatric symptoms effectively, uh, and they result in severe distress and safety issues, uh, acute pharmacological therapy with antipsychotics may become necessary. Efficacy is seldom complete, however, and often comes with the cost of side effects, including increased mortality. So the FDA has a black box warning stating that the first and second generation antipsychotic, uh, antipsychotics were associated with increased mortality uh, when used for the treatment of behavioral symptoms in older patients with dementia. Despite these warnings, uh, atypical antipsychotics are used in about 12 to 37% of dementia patients for the treatment of behavioral symptoms. 
antipsychotic medications are associated with an increased risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, and death. Uh, when used to treat behavioral symptoms in older patients with dementia, in particular, those with vascular disease. <clears throat> the mechanism for this effect has not really been firmly established. Uh, there is, a, however, a 1.7-fold increase in mortality compared to placebo. The excess mortality risk appears to be higher for first generations than the second generation drugs and varies among different second generation drugs as well, uh, being highest for olanzapine and risperdal and lowest for glutathione. Both short-term and long-term um, treatment is problematic and higher doses are associated with increased risk. The APA recommends that non-emergency antipsychotic medication should only be used for treatment of agitation or psychosis in patients with dementia, <clears throat> dementia when symptoms are severe, dangerous, and or cause significant distress to the patient. The potential risks and benefits from the antipsychotic medication should be assessed by the clinician and discussed with the patient if possible, as well as with the patient's dis uh, surrogate decision makers with input from family members. Benefits of antipsychotics often still outweigh their risks in patients with dementia when treatment of psychotic symptoms, uh, including hallucinations, paranoia, uh, delusions, it's critical for patient and caregiver safety, well being, and quality of life. Antipsychotics are, uh, are the agents of choice for treating psychotic symptoms, uh, including hallucinations, paranoia, and delusions. As is generally the rule with the elderly, uh, you want to use one drug at a time, uh, start with a low dose, and titrate slowly. There should be ongoing assessment of benefits versus harms, and withdrawal from medications should be considered periodically. Again, it's important to remember that identifying the reason for the genesis of the abnormal behavior is critical for uh, effective management. Some special situations that are worth mentioning uh, are patients with Lewy body dementia. These patients are particularly sensitive to antipsychotic medications uh, and may experience idiosyncratic, uh, life-threatening adverse reactions. Here, you generally, generally want to start with a cholinesterase inhibitor. If pharmacological intervention is necessary, it's advisable to use quetiapine. <clears throat> you want to minimize um, dopamin dopaminergic medications uh, but specifically avoid uh, typical antipsychotics or risperdal. Another special consideration would be Parkinson's disease. Patients with Parkinson's disease may experience neuropsychiatric symptoms related uh, to the <laughs> related to the disease itself or to medications used to treat treated, including uh, cognitive dysfunction, hallucinations and other psychotic symptoms, anxiety, apathy, and mood disorders such as depression. D disorders of sleep and wakefulness are common, including insomnia, parasomnias, restless leg syndrome, and daytime sleepiness. Psychosis is a frequent complication of Parkinson's disease. It is characterized mainly by visual hallucinations and delusions, which are often paranoid in concept. Hallucinations are the most common manifestations, and they affect up to 40% of patients with Parkinson's disease, particularly those at the advanced stage of their illness. If antipsychotic drugs are deemed necessary, <coughs> preferred agents in patients with Parkinson's disease include quetiapine, nuplazid, and clozapine. Quetiapine can be started at 12.5 milligrams and titrated up to 100 milligrams if needed. Neoplasid carries the FDA indications for hallucination <coughs> for hallucinations and delusion, delusions associated with Parkinson's disease psychosis. It can be started and continued at 34, 34 milligrams once daily, once daily, so there's no need to titrate. Clozapine is started at 12 and a half milligrams at night and can be titrated for 50 to 50 milligrams or more as needed. <coughs> 
Clozapine may be the most effective in this context, uh, but the need for hematological monitoring uh, limits its, its use as a first line option. All three of these agents have a low likelihood of exacerbating uh, Parkinsonism uh, in contrast to the first generation antipsychotics, as well as the second generation antipsychotics, such as uh, some of the second generation antipsychotics, such as Risperdal and Olanzapine. In the absence of clear differences uh, in efficacy uh, among various drugs, <laughs> selection of a specific drug is primarily based on consideration of side effects and individual patient characteristics. These are the commonly used antipsychotics that are used in this setting. Uh, as you can notice, these starting doses are much smaller than what you would use in an average younger adult. Typically, starting doses for frail or older patients will be one-third to one-half the starting dose used to treat psychosis in younger individuals. <clears throat> There's generally little evidence for the use of typical antipsychotics in this context, except uh, with the exception of Haldol. There was a 2002 systemic review that concluded Haldol may help aggression, but no other neuropsychiatric manifestations of dementia. Side effects of Haldol included high rates of EPS and decline in cognitive function even at lower doses. Uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that IV formulations are associated with clinically significant QTC prolongation. Uh, the APA does not recommend Haldol as a first-line agent for non-emergent use in individuals with dementia. They state that um, in emergent situations or in the context of delirium, delirium, use of Haldol may still be appropriate given its availability in an intravenous and short-acting IM formulation and its rap uh, relatively rapid onset of action relative to other uh, parental antipsychotic medications. However, if long-term treatment is indicated, a different agent should be chosen as a first-line medication. The atypicals were seen to have at most a modest effect on agitation skills. Uh, of the atypicals, risperdal and lanzapine have the best evidence for efficacy. Uh, adverse effects are common in patients with dementia and are often dose-related, uh, including EPS symptoms, uh, confusion, somnolence, and an increased risk of falls and fractures. In fact, uh, FDA issued a formal warning in 2017 uh, about the risk of falls and fractures and recommended that a fall risk assessment be completed when initiating antipsychotic treatment and recurrently for patients continuing on long-term antipsychotics. The APA recommends that in patients with dementia, with agitation or psychosis, if there's no clinically, clinically significant response after a four week trial of an adequate dose of an antipsychotic drug, uh, the medication should be tapered and withdrawn. All right. So um, these are some of the APA recommendations for routine monitoring for dementia patients on antipsychotics. Um, they recommend that an abnormal movement skill or an AIMS to check for tardive dyskinesia be conducted every six months. And baseline labs include uh, blood pressure, uh, weight, BMI, waist circumference, hemoglobin A1C, and a fasting lipid profile. Uh, they recommend getting uh, waist circumference annually after that as well. Blood pressure and fasting, <coughs> and fasting plasma and glucose uh, should be done at 12 weeks and annually after baseline labs. Weight with BMI should be checked monthly for three months and then quarterly after that. This would be more of an outpatient consideration 
Um, the APA recommends that this continuation uh, should be attempted at regular intervals, uh, weighing the risk of relapse uh, versus the risk of adverse effects from continued treatment. They recommend that an attempt to taper and withdraw antipsychotic therapy be made within four months of initiation in patients who have responded to therapy and who have no prior history of relapse of medication taper. Of note, this recommendation is not intended to apply to individuals with pre-existing psychotic, disorder, psychotic disorders, such as schizophrenia, uh, for, who, uh, for whom ongoing antipsychotic treatment may be necessary. As with decisions about initiating antipsychotic treatment, <clears throat> as with decisions about initiating antipsychotic treatment, it is essential to obtain input from uh, patients, family, and other caregivers on an ongoing basis and review their preferences, values, and concerns about continued treatment or tapering in a person-centered fashion. All right. <clears throat> I wanted to conclude the presentation um, by highlighting some of the clinical takeaways that we covered in the talk. We started the presentation by covering some commonly used agitation scales that can be helpful in the management of agitation, agitated patients with dementia. These included the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Inventory, a Brief Agitation Rating Scale, and the Neuropsychiatric Inventory. We discussed that non-pharmacological options are first line for these patients. We covered that it's generally recommended to start a cholinesterase inhibitor uh, for patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms and mild to moderate dementia. As for antidepressants, we covered that evidence for efficacy of SSRIs in the treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia is limited other than for depression. In this context, it may be useful to try sertraline, citalopram, or trazodone. We looked at the use of Depakote uh, and how in some patients who are not a viable candidate for antipsychotics, this may be a potential option, <clears throat> though the evidence for its benefit is limited. We covered that generally you want to avoid benzodiazepines uh, as well as anticholinergic medications like Benadryl in this patient population. Finally, we looked at the appropriate non-emergent use of antipsychotics in this patient population <clears throat> to be when symptoms are severe, dangerous, and or cause significant distress to the patient. We covered the increased risk of mortality associated with the use of antipsychotics. Um, we covered that Haldol may help control aggression, but no other neuropsychiatric manifestations of dementia. <clears throat> In terms of the atypicals, we covered that Risperdal and Olanzapine have the best evidence for efficacy. Finally, we concluded that if a patient does not respond uh, to antipsychotic treatment in a four week period, then the medication be tapered off and withdrawn. Alrighty, so I hope you found this presentation helpful. Um, I've been talking for a minute, so, but that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we will move on to look at references and then questions. And thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. That was very, very thorough and informative. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Hassan? Yeah, I'd love to ask a couple of questions. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. A um, couple of questions. So one of the things you mentioned was that um, Risperdal has been approved in some non-US countries. Do you know if Seroquel, which was one of the ones that were recommended, it sounded like, although you mentioned that Risperdal and uh, Zyprexa were better to some degree, if that's been approved in any overseas countries or if any other uh, antipsychotics have been approved in overseas countries? Yeah, that, that's, that's a valid question. Um, I think from, from my readings and what I tried to look for, um, Risperdal was the only one that I knew has been approved. Um, I didn't particularly like specifically look at Seroquel, um, but yeah, that, that's a valid question. Um, Risperdal, I knew I, I looked at, but I don't, I, I couldn't, I, I don't, I, I can't say that I found evidence of Seroquel, but I didn't particularly look for it either. But yeah, that's a valid thought for sure. And the other question I had was uh, I was surprised to see Clozaril, albeit a low dose, uh, for the Parkinson's related symptoms, given the intensity of um, lab work that needs to be followed with this. So that was one question. And then I was 
very <laughs> intrigued by your comment on that demented patients in a non-aggressive fashion can have intentional falling. Is there a volitional aspect with the demented patients that they will choose to uh, intentionally fall? Is it attention seeking or what might this be about? Um, yeah, that's, those, are, those are all great thoughts. Um, in terms of the intentional falling, so that comes out of the Cohen Mansfield uh, agitation inventory. Um, it's one of like literally one of the uh, behaviors that, that are categorized. Um, and that comes from like really old research, I think from the eighties. Um, and sorry, so uh, what was your second question? Uh, use of Closerel for Parkinson's um, that given the Closerel we use pretty well, sort of quite late in the process in psychotic illness. Um, given all the lab monitoring, I was very surprised at its possible use um, after, say, Saraquil for inside dementia. Yeah, that, that's that's a great thought as well. Um, so, clozapine, I think from from, the, from what I read and my understanding is, you know, it doesn't lead to worsening EPS symptoms. Um, so, you want to try some of these other options first, like uh, you know, Saraquil or Nuplazid, uh, and then you might move on to like Clozapine. Um, I think I've treated. I've, I've cared for one patient, and, and we tried all. Uh, we tried. He, they had Parkinson's. We tried new plasid. Uh, they, fa they failed the trial, and then they eventually were moved to Clozeril. Uh, I'm an outpatient, but from from what I understood, they they did well on Clozeril. But certainly, you know, you have to do routine blood monitoring. Uh, this person was in an um, in an, like a ALF type setting where we could do blood draws, and they had primary care that was following him every day. Uh, so that was very fortunate for this individual, but. Yeah, certainly, certainly a valid concern. Uh, concern. I think it's that's. I think it's that's why we, you know, if you recommend it for second line, uh, but certainly, you know, you have a lot of monitoring that you have to do. Um, you know, check for components, um, CBC, and all that, uh, all that jazz. So yeah. Thank you so much for that question. Nobody else has a question and I don't want to hog the time. Uh, I literally kind of smiled when I saw pregnancy as a test to be done. I know there may be young patients that are demented, but that's typically not something oh. I'm typically thinking about with Alzheimer's <laughs> or other demented patients, but that was an interesting thing to see there. Yeah, uh, that's certainly valid. <laughs> well, that will cover for the patients that they have the neurocognitive impairment for the, the result of the TBI. Um, usually the pregnancy would be. Um, one thing that uh, I noticed, uh, you mentioned something about the, after four weeks, if it's not effective to discontinue the uh, unpsychotic, um, how about if it's effective, it's also, um, and some recommendation is that when you start the antipsychotic or the behavioral disturbance of the elderly patients, you don't have to continue it all the, all the way to the rest of their life. So have you come up with any evidence base uh, in your research that uh, was recommending to either discontinue or continue the medication is if it is effective? Yeah. Um, I. That's a great point. Um, and, you know, looking at discontinuation, um, the APA says, you know, four months, you look at if the medication is still needed, um, you know, you, you want the family to be involved in that process. You know, do they think that the risks versus the benefit, do an analysis of that. Um, if their behavior symptoms, you know, are worth managing without medications. Um, of course, you know, this wouldn't necessarily be applicable for people with like, you know, um, like chronic, like schizophrenia or like PTSD, where they, they might need that uh, antipsychotic for their primary psychological condition. Um, but yes, it's a team approach. You know, you want to get the family pulled in, you want to get the caregiver pulled in. Um, you want to ask him if, you know, if the risk is worth the, the mortality, um, the mortality risk is worth the benefit specifically for like behavioral symptoms. Um, and you want to do it at, at the, the APA, like I said, it's every four months, you know, at least there should be a conversation about behavioral symptoms, that kind of thing. But yeah, that, that's a valid thought. 
Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that. Do we have any further questions? All right, well, again, Syed, thank you so much for that presentation. Good work, and uh, thank you everyone for attending.